Hello, everyone, and welcome to, today, to today's SSP webinar on being author friendly. I'm Jeff Lang with the American Chemical Society and the chair of the SSP webinars working group, and we're pleased you could join us today. In a moment, we'll get started and hear from our moderator and panelists. You'll be seeing the SSP flash screen during this introduction and once we reach the discussion portion of the webinar. Your phone will be muted automatically in consideration of our presenters and your fellow webinar participants. Please use the questions feature to send in your questions or if you need to let us know that you're having technical difficulties. The moderator will review these questions and present them to panelists. To help her, please specify to which presenter you'd like your question directed. And also, please send in your questions as we go instead of waiting until the end. At the conclusion of today's presentation, you'll receive a webinar evaluation via email. We encourage you to provide feedback so that we can continually improve the SSP webinar program. You will also receive a link via email to the recorded broadcast of this webinar and to the slides. Our moderator today is Ryan Looney. Ryan is the Client Services Manager at Overleaf. She's committed to making the world a better place by connecting scientists and researchers with the tools they need. At Overleaf, she works closely with institutional and publisher partners and authors to support scientific authoring. Ryan also worked on this webinar with Fiona Carr of OCLC and Tom Beyer of Sheridan, who could not join the session today. Here is Ryan, who will introduce the panel and get us started. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Jeff, for that introduction. And welcome, everyone, to the Being Author Friendly webinar today. We're really excited to have you all here, and we have some great uh, panelists with us as well. And today we're going to talk a little bit about how publishers can be more author friendly in today's world. There's a lot of competition for authors and for their resources. And we'd like to take some time to talk about how uh, publishers can attract and support those authors. Today's format will have um, each presenter will give a short presentation, and at the end of all three of the presentations, we'll have some time for Q&A. And as Jeff said, please go ahead and enter your questions into the question box um, when you um, have them come up, and um, we'll address your questions once all the presenters have had a chance to present. So now I'd like to take a moment and just introduce our presenters. Um, and uh, first up, we'll have uh, Andre Gall, who's the co-founder and CEO of Paperhive. He has a PhD in mathematics from the Technical University of Berlin, and he's an active contributor to a number of large open source software projects. As a Freifunk act activist, Andre builds decentralized parts of the internet with free network communities around the globe. Our next presenter will be Catherine Arundel, who is the head of researcher experience with Springer Nature. And um, she's uh, head of the uh, researcher experience for nature in the open research group. She previously has worked on the open access journal scientific reports from launch until 2017. Our final presenter today will be Lily Troya, who's the engagement manager with Altmetric. And she is a scholarly communication librarian and digital media outreach specialist serving as the engagement manager at Digital Science, where she works directly with publishers, authors, government agencies, funders, librarians, and other research lifecycle stakeholders. Her role is focused around helping organizations align data use with strategy and mission and better understanding the reach and impact of their research and publications. Again, I'd like to thank all of our uh, panelists for joining us today. And Andre will be up first. I have his slides on my screen, so um, let me take just a moment to share my screen with you, and then Andre, you can get started. Okay, it looks like uh, like we're up. Andre, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so today I'll talk to you a bit about uh, Paperhive and uh, how Paperhive can uh, help publishers to be more author friendly. Um, on the next slide, we uh, we see um, uh, how uh, collaboration and academia um, is uh, yeah bringing a shift to all phases of the researcher workflow. Um, basically, all the phases of um, of um, the researcher workflow have been affected by um, by collaboration. So, if we think about discovery. Assessments, publications, uh, uh, writing, for example, overleaf uh, and the analysis. 
Um, one aspect of the um, of this workflow hasn't been affected uh, so far by collaboration, and that is actually reading. And this is where Paperhive uh, comes in. So um, on the next slide, uh, we see um, what Paperhive actually looks like. So Paperhive is a scholarly collaboration network that is uh, connected to publisher websites. And what we're doing is we're enabling researchers and students to manage, to discuss, and to annotate uh, academic literature and collaboration. So if you look at that uh, screenshot here, um, you can see that uh, you um, can read the text um, right away in the, on the left part of the, of the screen and in the, on the right in the margin you have um, discussions that are happening right within the text. Um, so people can communicate in, um, in uh, articles or books. Um, these discussions can happen in private or in, in public. Um, and on the next slide, we see um, an overview what Paperhive uh, actually consists of. We think of it as um, three parts. So we're bringing together these three parts. On the right side, you see uh, documents. Um, so that's pretty clear. We, we allow people to read on, on Paperhive. Uh, the second bit uh, we bring together here on the platform is people, like students and researchers, and um, we bring them uh, together with communication. In this, in this case, uh, what I've just shown you, those are um, public or group discussions that are happening actually on the, on the version of record. Um, and the next slide, um, just a very brief overview um, how Paperhive can help a publisher to be uh, more author friendly um, and this is uh, really coming from our experience with uh, with publishers now um, on paperhive you can create author and reader communities who are really actively engaged with your content uh, through discussions so um, imagine an author um, a Q and A session, for example. So you can invite your your readers to participate in this Q and A session. Say, for example, uh, this uh, author is responding to to questions in this week. Um, so that's a, a, a great promise for your readers, and also authors are really enjoying this kind of uh, communication with their audience. Um, the second bit is. Um, the publisher and also the author gets uh, insights in how the content is used and this tremendously helps uh, everyone to improve the work. Imagine um, there are comments uh, saying, um, oh, I don't understand this, could you please explain this in a bit more detail. So if this happens more often in a specific part of the document, then um, probably you might want to fix that in the next uh, version. Uh, or in an upcoming publication. Um, it also really offers um, authors an, a very effective way to increase their impact and visibility. I know that authors are often very reluctant to do a kind of self-promotion uh, um, or um, uh, yeah, promoting their works, so because it feels a bit like uh, advertisement. Um, however, with uh, Paperhive, uh, it does not feel like advertisement because it isn't. <laughs> so you, you offer actually your readers um, um, insights and a direct communication channel to you as an author. Um, I just want to give you on the next slide a small overview of um, uh, two use cases. Um, the first one is the reader-author exchange I already mentioned. Uh, Q&A sessions on, on the content. Um, so obviously these discussions bring readers and authors closer together um, and uh, the, the discussions increase the reach and the impact of the publications. So um, that's mostly already covered. Uh, here you see an, an example where, uh, where an author is actually uh, responding to questions on a, on a book in this case. Um, on the next slide, there's another interesting uh, use case, and that is interactive teaching, um, which is uh, 
at first sight it's not related to uh, to authors but it really is um it, in the beginning it's just a it's it's a great way to help professors to spark students curiosity and um, also help them learning um, um so uh, in this case here you see a book where uh, a lecturer invited all the students in lecture to paper hive to this book and they could then ask uh, questions or clarify things um, right within the text uh, while they were reading or even right in the lecture um, so they had a direct communication channel among each other but um, actually interesting here is that sometimes also the authors come in and um, respond to questions that the students have which is great for everyone like the students are feeling more uh, embedded in this community the, the the author gets direct feedback and so on um, on the last uh, slide i uh, just want to uh, give you an overview of what uh, what paper hive uh, uh, brings you as a publisher uh, first of all, uh, you can really attract and retain the, the best um, uh, authors, You're giving them a, a great tool that uh, they really like, and uh, that's really our experience. Um, uh, it's very easy to integrate. You don't need to do anything on your side, uh, so no changes to the publisher platform. Just basically just tell us, and we are doing that. <laughs> um, uh, a nice side effect of all this is that um, the content is uh, content usage and impact is increased. Like if people are communicating in uh, your content, um, then uh, obviously it's uh, used uh, more. So, and this is automatically reflected in your usage statistics. So you can you can actually measure um, that usage that is happening on PayPal. And the last point is. Um, on paper hive uh, people can also manage the literature uh, in a copyright compliant way so um, that's also a great uh, benefit for you so this one bit with the easy integration is especially true for open access that's what we recently discovered and uh, that's why we're running um, actually an open access promotion till the end of the month so if you're interested in trying that um, please just let me know and that was um, my part of this uh, webinar so far. Um, if you have any questions, then um, please uh, ask them uh, in the, and go to webinar and we'll come back to that at the end. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andre, and um, info at paperhive.org for more information about that. I'm going to um, stop showing my screen now, so you should get that splash screen. Um, and again, thank you, Andre. And our next presenter is Catherine Arundel, the head of researcher experience for the uh, Nature Research Journals. And I will make her the presenter now so that she can go through her presentation as well. And again, please um, enter any questions that you might have for any of our presenters into the question panel on GoToWebinar. Okay, thank you, Ryan. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, fantastic. Um, right, so thanks for the introduction. Um, just give us a little bit more background about me. So as the head of researcher experience, I work with multiple stakeholders from editorial and publishing to technology, product and market intelligence um, to help continuously define what gold standard as an experience is or should be for researchers throughout the publishing life cycle. Um, I say researchers here rather than just authors, although I realize that the, uh, the webinar is titled for authors, but that's to acknowledge that typically author, reviewer, editor, and even reader are tasks performed by the same person rather than different user groups, and therefore to best serve the community, you need to consider the full complement of demands on their time. Um, so I started my career working with society publishers and academic journals, and that was before launching um, the Open Access Journal Scientific Reports uh, with formerly Nature Publishing Group and my colleagues here. Um, what that did is afford me a, a great wealth of experience supporting authors and editors and reviewers uh, from submission right through to publication, promotion and beyond um, and really drove my passion for supporting that holistic view of, of researcher experience. So. When we consider today's publishing world, 
uh, we naturally think of what's different and that can include the increase in research output, which corresponds with an increased demand on researchers' time, um, a growth in interdisciplinary research, the proliferation of new journals and non-journal publication platforms, as well as the rise of multiple community-driven preprint servers and data repositories. Um, at the same time, guidelines and mandates from funders are evolving rapidly, all of which means that there is a great deal more choice for authors but with that, they are having to deal with increased complexity when it comes to publishing decisions. It's also important um, to take a look at what isn't different with today's publishing world. Uh, and for that, it's very easy to sort of pinpoint um, most publishers' online submission or manuscript handling systems. Um, authors, you can imagine, are accustomed to a much slicker user experience in other aspects of their life if you consider key players in online shopping arena or you know just your typical search experience comparatively publisher systems can seem outdated and cumbersome and time consuming um, for authors to interact with so how can publishers be more author friendly uh, really to tackle the growth in complexity i feel we need to help demystify the publishing choices at all stages uh, and this can be from providing information and tools. Um, in the top corner there, I've got a little snapshot of the Spring of Nature Journal Suggester, which, you know, you can tap in your manuscript details and it will suggest potential journals to you. Um, or we have a submission plan um, on our Early Career Researcher Hub to help, you know, authors who are just starting out identify the right journal for their work. And that can be obviously in scope or editorial criteria. Um, the idea behind that is, is that if you can help reduce inappropriate submissions, then you help reduce the duplication of effort that goes into peer review across multiple submissions also. Um, and that helps researchers in, in several of their different roles. Um, or you can look at things as simple as ensuring that journal instructions are findable, easy to follow, and the authors understand why they're being asked for certain pieces of information rather than just being asked for them. To give one example, uh, for scientific reports, scientific reports even, there are quality checks at submission, and that's so our external editorial editors and peer reviewers receive all the information they need to assess a manuscript and to ensure compliance with the Nature Research editorial and publishing policies. What this does is allow papers, once they are submitted, to progress smoothly through peer review and means that we don't come across anything unexpected that could make a, pub a paper unpublishable later after the research community has invested time uh, assessing and reviewing it. Now, the submission process can vary across the portfolio, but we are working towards aligning these for the reasons I've just mentioned. Um, to follow, on that example, by proportion of papers that fail that quality check I mentioned, and this is again an example that's specific to scientific reports, although probably similar, 25% fail for missing, missing ethics approval and 25% can fail for missing patient consent, which is not to say that the researcher didn't have it, they just didn't provide it up front. Uh, and yet despite this, feedback I hear from authors is frequently um, they refer to these checks as being for formatting, which ethics and consent clearly aren't, which indicates to me that we're not yet doing a good enough job of representing these requirements or why they are being checked. So in terms of making submission easier from a process point of view, um, there are opportunities to integrate with online writing tools, electronic lab books, um, preprint servers, um, thinking of online writing tools, Obelief and ShareLatex are obviously a, obvious examples with Ryan on the call. Um, and done properly, you know, these have the potential to reduce submission steps and also to move the article preparation guidance upstream so that elements like the ethical approval that I just mentioned are properly described at the time of writing rather than a new sort of surprise to somebody at the point of submission. Um, more generally, can we make the process of submission easier? Um, authors are very busy and would like to provide the minimum amount of information that is practicable for a submission to be considered. 
So at Springer Nature, we are working on aligning submission requirements across journals. Um, I personally would extend this a step further and ask the question, why shouldn't there be a standard minimum amount of information across publishers so the authors are not stuck in rounds of preparing and re-preparing their research for submission to different journals? Of course, I'm not suggesting that publishers would or even should join forces with one centralized system or infrastructure. There needs to be space for innovation and competition. But from an author perspective, it would be very attractive to have some level of standardization of submission information and metadata and formatting requirements or lack of that are required to get their paper to a first editorial assessment. Um, Again, with making submission easier, another thing we've been doing at Springer Nature is taking steps to try and improve the submission experience for authors. And in 2017, we rolled out a new submission experience to 33 of the Nature Research Journals. And we continue to make lots of small improvements to simplify the publishing process, all trying to make that task of submitting a paper easier. So moving on a bit, then another way that publishers can be more author friendly is obviously to add value. Um, and that can be either during the peer review process uh, by putting things in place to ensure that authors receive constructive feedback on their submissions, um, from providing training resources to reviewers and external editors. That's something that I think would really help because the level of training for these tasks that researchers receive through their institutions can be variable. And by taking responsibility for this as publishers, we can help ensure a consistent quality of peer review and that new and emerging standards are known. And that goes some way, I hope, to giving back to the community that puts so many hours into reviewing research. Um, so to briefly go back to the point about helping demystify the publishing choices, this is a slide uh, that gives a little example of the funding and support services uh, resource from Springer Nature, which is designed to help authors understand the different funder requirements and policies specifically for open access and provide support for those authors who need help paying article processing charges, as well as book and chapter processing charges. Um, we also offer research data support. Um, it's an optional range of services to authors who have data sets they want to share, uh, that make safe and citable and improve the discoverability and reuse potential. Uh, this includes services from a free to access data help desk, um, all the way up to Springer Nature's deposition to a Figshare repository uh, that supplies a citable and linkable DOI for data with metadata curation and advice on data presentation and formatting. And this speaks back to the earlier point about the growing complexity of, of just the amount of tasks that researchers really have to answer to get their papers published these days. Um, so yeah, just uh, to wrap up that little whistle-stop tour of the challenges authors face in their interactions with publishers, the simplest way I can think to describe what constitutes a great author experience is just the absence of anything going wrong. Sounds easy, but to be more author friendly, we should work towards reducing the time that they have to spend on publishing and administrative tasks, which is time far better spent on any one of their other many facets of being a researcher. Uh, so yes, thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Um, I really appreciate your presentation. And um, I'm going to now change our presenter over to uh, Lily Troya of Digital Science so she can give her presentation. And then um, we'll start answering questions um, after Lily's presentation. So Lily, there you go. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us today. I uh, really appreciate um, your attendance. Thanks for the invitation. And hopefully um, my session uh, will really actually go quite well after the two previous presentations that we just heard. Um, and so I'm going to discuss how altmetrics, you know, can be author friendly for publishers in terms of this idea of engagement and ultimately maximizing these pathways uh, from visibility to downstream impact. You know, the basic reality is if no one's reading your author's publications, the publications you're producing and supporting, 
um, they're not going to be able to have the types of impact and success that we want them to have. And I think there's a lot of conversations in the current environment right now around this idea between visibility and downstream impact. And that impact is a lot of different things at a lot of different organizations uh, within a lot of different disciplines. Um, so that targeted audiences, helping your authors connect their content to the audiences that can really um, help build upon it, uh, lead to changes in practice, policy, et cetera. Um, this is gonna be really key, and I think one of the ways where Altmetrics comes into play. Uh, it also help us understand that, you know, how and where they're sharing and using um, your author's publications that you support and produce. You know, so altmetrics start out, um, you know, with this immediacy in the digital environment of helping us understand really who is engaging with our publications. Um, and as we can see, you know, we know that citations take a long time to develop. Altmetrics are not a replacement for citation data, but they really help us understand audiences and engagement around research right away. And this is data that your authors are interested in. You know, as we can see from the landing page versus the altmetrics details page, on the other side of the screen, um, this publication from April of 2008 uh, has had just one or two, two or three citations uh, dependent on you know, your source, yet lots of global engagement across mainstream news, uh, specialty blogs, certainly social media, even video content on uh, YouTube. So altmetrics, you know, in and of themselves are not impact, but there are these great indicators of online attention and engagement uh, that's happening with your digitally published research. And I work with researchers and authors directly as much as I work with publishers, funders, um, and uh, government organizations, et cetera. And, you know, they come to expect that this data is available to them alongside the other publication metrics and say web analytics uh, that now uh, publishers in practice are often providing to authors. Um, and what is the ultimate goal? Now, certainly uh, different types of research, again, define impact in different ways, but we want to channel this pathway from awareness, again, finding uh, your author's publications, to engagement, uh, to interacting with it, to sharing it, to commenting upon it, and moving it into a, a new audience and sphere um, where it can ultimately have that impact. Um, and, and again, that impact is potentially something defined um, you know, in different ways across different fields, but I think there's a lot of alignment to know that that impact means more than just a, an end citation count. Um, we work with a lot of different organizations at Altmetric that are looking to things like high profile news media and social media coverage from key stakeholders like uh, senators, uh, MPs, um, policy makers, scientists that they can collaborate with down the line. Um, lots of publishers are experimenting with reaching the general public in different ways, like digital magazines, uh, like Knowable Magazine that you see here on the screen. So the author benefits, again, science and research, academic Twitter, uh, this is huge right now. You know, we, we definitely know that research is being shared and discussed more and more on social media forums, um, not just Twitter, Facebook, uh, Reddit, uh, Stack Exchange, et cetera. Um, but altmetrics offer authors a, a lot of, um, you know, more benefits just beyond that communication and engagement potential. Um, and because we work in such a global environment, you know, no matter where we are located as publishers, our authors may have to be ascribing to actual impact in forms of evaluation and reporting that goes into the social realm. Uh, those in the UK working on the REF, um, people incorporating um, broader forms of impact into tenure and promotion, uh, review. I work closely with a lot of agriculture researchers via some projects at Virginia Tech. Uh, you know, impact to them involves many audiences and stakeholders, and they need to understand who those are. Um, they need to uncover and connect to these collaboration networks, new opportunities, you know, find out what research is being talked about, shared and funded most currently. Um, and then often evidence impact for all types of publications, you know, digital humanities uh, websites, um, reports, learning curricula. As publishers, you can help um, your authors, uh, as just pointed out, say, understand how to share their data, um, monographs, you know, these types of publications, not just scholarly articles, can really benefit from the types of information that Altmetrics offer us, all these unique 
online audiences that really are, are a lot of different types of stakeholders. Um, and as um, just mentioned in the previous presentation as well, thanks so much, you know, this idea that publishers, you know, you can work with your authors to better understand and help them chart the pathways from increased visibility to impact. Which are the right journals for them to publish in? You know, we often see looking at altmetric data that say um, the journals that end up with the most references in patents or policy documents are not necessarily those that say have the broadest, uh, most popular reach. Um, so again, dependent on the type of impact and reach that your author wants, um, helping them make those better decisions is going to be really strategic. Um, and that ties to which audiences again, and where all of those different audiences are accessing the information. So those distribution channels all tie back to that. And of course, just staying on top of the most current research trends and conversations globally um, and in an interdisciplinary environment. You know, a few examples, you know, altmetric data is um, going to give us the ability to say showcase economic influence uh, and social innovation, charting longitudinal impact um, that your authors can showcase, uh, things like references in uh, global policy documents, um, patents. You know, at Altmetric specifically, um, while certainly social media is a strong source of Altmetric attention, the second largest source of data that we find references to publications in is intellectual property patent applications. Um, so, you know, we're, we're getting that data from a huge patent um, database, IFI Claims, which is part of the digital science umbrella. You can audit that via dimensions pages related to the patents as well. All kinds of rich data, again, that sits outside of that traditional publication metric spectrum. Um, one of the things I'm really excited about now at Altmetric specifically is that we want to help people and your authors and you as publishers identify who these key influencers are and digital communicators that, that your authors need to connect to. Um, actually just launched today is our ability to now search by uh, fields of research and institutional affiliations. Um, so you uh, can find out what institutions are associated with your publications, Authors uh, can really find out across a whole discipline or different disciplines where conversations are happening right now. Um, and this helps us uncover who those key influencers are. You know, for example, surgeons who, when they share research content online on Twitter, share it out to nearly 300,000 followers. Um, you know, your authors uh, might want to connect with these people. So have you tried or perhaps encouraged your authors um, to experiment and think about different ways to increase visibility, um, to hone in and connect on those types of impacts and pathways? You know, lots of, of publishers are doing video content on YouTube. Um, the Routledge does author um, you know, videos uh, where they can explain information both to, you know, more lay audiences, but also scholarly audiences. Um, we can also see things like uh, Twitter chats, um, curated blogs. Um, lots of publishers I talk to are experimenting with things like Wikipedia edit-a-thons, where they can ensure that the public is accessing information that links back to their uh, published expertise. Um, you know, also new products. Um, you know, do you have a canonical expertise in a field that you can show an author that you can get them reach for maybe an older publication or a, a piece that, you know, shows that they have contributed to a field of research over time in a way that um, is really seminal. Um, lots of different uses of altmetric data. I would really enjoy speaking with you and strategizing around the different ways that you can help authors um, understand and showcase their altmetric data as well. Publishers are doing this. Um, I like these couple examples. Um, you know, lots of um, publisher author services pages as um, was just shown that educate current authors about, say, responsible, efficient use of altmetrics, the many resources that, you know, my company and other companies have for authors um, to engage and help share their research strategically online. Um, but also your potential authors. Um, uh, you know, this uh, JAMA ophthalmology submission um, information page certainly lists impact factor, uh, page hits and downloads, um, but all the items highlighted in blue are basically examples of altmetric type attention that they, they assume potential authors are interested in and see value in. 
we will get you extensive press coverage. You know, we are typically among the most attention receiving publications within our field. You know, not only citations, um, but again, broad reach by all these different channels. You know, the, the amount of publications, you know, the time constraints referenced uh, just previously, authors do want to know that, you know, you're able to help them get their research out in this strategic way. And not just your authors, letting your readers who are also potential authors and reviewers know about altmetrics. You know, let them um, see that your publications are engaged with in unique audiences. Um, they get broadly shared um, in the places that it's going to have the most impact. Um, lots of publishers certainly share altmetric data alongside uh, their publications. Um, recent um, publication attention, maybe publication attention in certain areas. Um, these, you know, badges, these displays of different types of metrics alongside traditional and web analytics, I, I, I think are something that authors really come to expect now. So, you know, regardless of the way that you want to share and display that data, I think that um, those who interact with our publications, you know, they want to see this and authors certainly do as well. Um, so with that, I will uh, tie it up. I don't want to take up too much of your time, and I know we wanted to leave ample time for conversation as well. Um, I, uh, like I said, I work really closely with uh, folks uh, throughout the publication and research life cycle, and one of my favorite things is uh, strategizing and brainstorming about ways that um, altmetric data alongside lots of other information can really support um, our collective ultimate goals of getting uh, important research out uh, uh, to the broadest, most strategic places as possible. So thank you. Thank you, Lily, for that presentation. Um, I really appreciate that. That was that was great. Um, so we do have quite a few questions already that are coming through the, the question panel. And so please um, continue to write in your questions. But um, I'll, I'll start asking those out to our presenters now. So um, one of the questions that we had come in early um, was for Catherine just to clarify um, what ethics approval is and where that falls um, within your author submission process. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So um, ethical approval, speaking for the for the journals that I work with, um, applies to animal research, but also to human participants, human samples, um, and it's important when in clinical research as well um, and that is obviously just to check that authors gained all the correct approvals to do the research before doing it um, and then beyond that they also have to specify that in the research so that readers know who approved something um, and so on. Um, there's more to it than that, but I'm afraid I don't do the checking of this and haven't done for All some right. time so the the exact things. But yeah, there's there's a there's sort of from an author's point of view, there's a there's a two to three step process. And one is gaining the correct approval before they even do their work. The second is ensuring that they have done the work in accordance with the approvals that they received so that they are not changing the experiments in any way from what was approved. And then thirdly, when it comes to publication or not even just publication, but peer review, we need to know, our editors and our reviewers need to know and have that information available to them so that they can be sure that the work they're assessing had correct approvals. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks for that explanation. And then um, kind of a follow on to that question, how did you find out what the author pain points were in that submission process? Did you use surveys? Did you talk to them directly? For me personally, um, I have a, a long history of dealing with authors. Um, you know, starting many years ago as a publishing assistant, I used to check papers that were coming in. I used to support authors, um, you know, on a one-to-one -one basis with their submission process. So I have uh, the accumulative history of, of, of problems and questions that I've received, but then in a more data-driven way, um, I do have an author survey that goes out to all of the authors at um, the journals that I work on. So we have a post-submission survey in particular, as well as a post-publication survey. So any pain points related to submission are collected in a in a more systematic way um, that, and data that I analyze. 
Thank you. And then, and then again, sort of following on that as well, how uh, can you sh uh, tell us a few examples of how you did change that new submission system um, in response to those those pain points on the on the 33 journals you had referred to in your presentation? Okay, I'm going to be very honest here. I didn't change that. That's something that our technology teams uh -huh. worked on. I have seen it, and I'm going to reach back into my memory. Um, the general themes fit very well with the presentation I gave, which is really trying to remove any unnecessary questions. Um, I think in a lot of legacy systems, especially uh, systems that are, are geared to, you know, particular specific workflows or have, um, gosh, I don't know, prints or issues or, or more discipline specific things within them, there can be a weight of redundant questions that are still asked because they always were, but that are not really necessary. So. I think it starts always with re-asking the question of what do we need to process a submission and then stripping back questions that, that were not necessary. And then beyond that, you know, can those be collected in a more user-friendly way? Um, I guess subject terms are a really good example. Uh, they're, they're quite cumbersome to um, input in the, the old version of the screen, whereas improvements were made to the the user experience on the new version to make it easier for authors to select those terms. Thank you. I have a couple of questions that came up for Andre and Paperhive as well. Um, one of the questions is um, if you could share a little bit about how Paperhive's process is different than other preprint servers. Yes, yeah, so, um, Paperhive is not really a preprint server, so um, it's uh, um, uh, basically we include all kinds of uh, of content. So this includes um, preprint servers. So we we also um, fetch documents from uh, uh, from archive, for example. But um, primarily, we actually integrate content that is coming from uh, publishers directly. So, um, and this is um, actually quite interesting because we are not hosting any of the content uh, that you can read on Paperhive. Um, we just pull in the documents dynamically from the publisher website whenever a reader is um, opening um, such a document on Paperhive. Um, and one of the benefits of that is that um, you directly see all usage that is happening on Paperhive. Um, you see all the usage on on your uh, platform and your metrics that you um, have already. So you don't need to add not yet another um, feed of data uh, to benefit from uh, from uh, the Paperhive usage. Um, and also, the, the other benefit is that it's very easy to integrate. Uh, so um, we only fetch metadata from Crossref, and uh, then every time a user opens a document, uh, we, we try to fetch that document from your platform, and uh, it respects your, um, um, your authentication that you have in place. Oh, that's that's great information. Thank you, Andre. And then another follow-up question for you is: um, If an author is offended by reader comments, can those offensive comments be deleted? Is there any control that um, the platform or the author has to, in effect, moderate those comments? So, if um, so, we're very clear about um, about such um, yeah inappropriate comments. Um, so. A, they're not. Uh, th this is not allowed by our um, by, by our terms of service. Um, so if you if you don't oblige, then we might just delete that. And um, if it's even if it's worse, if it's like uh, hate speech or uh, threats or something like that, then we immediately remove these comments as soon as we are aware of that, um, which is actually our duty under uh, German law. And we're happy to remove this kind of content, but everything else that is, um, let's say, is not illegal, this um, will stay on the platform. Um, and uh, we, of course, 
encourage everyone to um, to discuss in a in a reasonable and friendly way on the platform. And so far, we actually have not seen a single case of misbehavior on on the platform, which is great. But if uh, um, if this happens, we're actually prepared for that. <laughs> That's great to hear. Thank you. And then I have a question for, for Lily as well. Has there been any research performed linking blog posts to impact factor um, in any way? Uh, that's an interesting question. Um, so in the altmetrics research sphere, I would say there's um, lots of lots of folks that are really interested in trying to uncover if there are correlations between altmetrics data and say other types of publication metrics and data. Um, the, uh, I would say one, the impact factor versus say altmetric data, remember altmetrics are at an article or output level. So there wouldn't necessarily be an analogous a direct comparison, say to an impact factor, but there have been lots of studies that are trying to understand uh, whether or not altmetric data, early indications of, alt, uh, of attention around research publications can allude to potential downstream impact. Um, one research piece that came out last year in Science and Metrics uh, looked at specifically this idea of blogs and downstream citations um, and found that across uh, 15 different disciplines, when research was blogged about, uh, so when it was shared in some sort of uh, curated or synthesized, again, uh, way, not necessarily just for a broader uh, public audience, um, it did lead to an increase in citations. Um, we've heard this anecdotally from research for a couple of years. Uh, it's been something um, uh, a researcher um, has ex mentioned to us, say, you know, when I blogged about my research, I found that, of course, traffic increased to those publications, and then later those were built upon more with citations. Um, but the research piece I just referred to was really interesting because across 15 different disciplines, disciplines uh, uh, STEM and social science, there was a 5% increase uh, when research that had been blogged about um, then in, in citation counts down the line, but specifically was very high in a lot of fields um, that some of which would have surprised you. So certainly something like health professions and nursing, there was an over 35% increase, uh, medical and medicine sciences over 24, but some areas like economics, um, math, um, you know, areas that we don't necessarily assume get a lot of kind of high social engagement saw increases well over 10%. Um, my kind of theory is that, you know, in addition to simply a blog type format being able to get information to different and new audiences that researchers and authors themselves are really looking to these new formats to try to connect to the newest, most relevant publications um, that, you know, maybe do cross interdisciplinary boundaries, um, then show the way that, say, research is moving and uh, makes sense that those ones would then be um, accessed, read, and built upon more quickly. Thanks, Lily. That's really interesting. Um, I have one question that might be um, directed toward toward everyone, and I know it's something that that I've thought a lot about as well in my career in scholarly publishing. But um, what are your ideas and suggestions to motivate peer reviewers, and how might that help turn around the time to publication? I know from my own experience that um, both finding reviewers um, who might be eligible to review and then getting those reviewers to agree to review and then um, actually collecting those reviews can sometimes be a lengthy process. And, and how might some of these author-friendly um, ideas and initiatives affect peer review as well? Yeah, so uh, maybe I can comment on that. Um, so having done uh, lots of reviews myself when I was researching, um, uh, I think um, I think uh, it's uh, mostly a lack of uh, proper tools um, that these um, like the submission systems are really complicated. And I think um, like uh, suggestions uh, like uh, we, we've just seen where, where to submit things, for example, um, if you have 
uh, this kind of guidance also during the, the peer review uh, process when you're reviewing, um, this will uh, probably also be very helpful. Um, of course, so one motivation we had with Paperhive was also to po possibly open that up for um, for peer review. You can actually if you can actually do that on on Paperhive. There's one a publisher doing a, a transparent open peer review on Paperhive and people are really uh, more engaged in this environment um, but I can see this, that this does not work in all communities so I don't have I don't uh, claim to have the uh, solution for all disciplines or for all cases but I think experimenting with uh, new tools out there um, is really the way to go in my opinion. Thanks, Andre. I would just, that's just, this is Lily, and I would just piggyback off of that by saying, you know, a lot of altmetric data shows us that uh, these, these post-publication peer review conversations are certainly happening more and more in specific organized, uh, you know, forums like, you know, places like PubLons and PubPeer and uh, Faculty of 1000, but also on a lot of specialty blogs and niche um, places. So I think it, can be really helpful for publishers to, to know where these conversations are often happening outside of those traditional channels. Maybe if you're trying to target new reviewers as well. Um, a lot of publishers I work with, you know, will use uh, altmetric data to help chart, say, um, potential research integrity issues as well, stay on top of conversations um, that might allude to controversy um, or something that they really want to be ahead of the curve on. Thanks, Lily. Yeah, uh, this is Catherine. So I would um, I would probably speak just to some of the the real simple basics when it comes to how we're serving reviewers. It's it's not technology. It's not super cool, but I think a lot of reviewer guidelines can be improved. I think that you know just really looking at what reviewers are asked and making sure that it's simple and understandable for them to even begin to understand what they need to do per journal and what they're expected to assess for that manuscript will help save them some time. Um, the point about motivation, if you can get research in front of researchers that they're interested in, that's a great motivation for them to, to want to review it. So I think, you know, Andre picked up better matching tools to make sure that um, that we are sending the right papers to the right people is, is a real improvement there. Um, and then, yeah, I, I, I'd come back to researcher training just to, to reiterate that point again. Um, anything that can be given back to the community to make sure that, you know, we are helping them to help us as publishers is, is going to be a benefit for everyone. There was a a quote from our CEO, Daniel Ropers, at the Frankfurt Bank Book Fair, and he said, if Springer Nature could save one hour for every peer reviewer on each review, that would return a million hours per year to scientists for their own science. So it really is important to make sure that we are looking at this issue and ensuring that we're helping reviewers. Yeah, thank you, Catherine, for that. Um, another question that came in that, that might be a little bit related to this, um, was one of the challenges for authors and, and I guess by extension reviewers are complicated instructions for manuscript preparation and submission. And, and this goes doubly so for um, uh, researchers whose first language might not be English. So what improvements have, have there been in the past few years or what improvements do you see coming in the future that might help um, researchers who's, who are not English speakers to, to be able to publish? i sorry, was that directed at me? Um, yes, but, but any of you really, yeah. <laughs> Um, I think it's a very interesting question. Uh, I think um, I think it's something that people are beginning to look at. Um, we did a trial. I'm trying to think of the details off the top of my head here on the the new submissions screen that I mentioned earlier. I think there was a very short, limited trial um, for interest of whether researchers would like to see 
um, instructions in Chinese. I think it was just a yes, no box and it popped up and said, great, thanks. We'll think about doing that. Um, I don't have the results, but that is just sort of one indication that it's something that we're beginning to look at. But this is this is um, this is just me thinking out loud. Now you've, you've got to make sure that you're thinking about the entire publication workflow when you're looking into that. Because if you have to provide your instructions in another language, do you then have to ensure that your resource to provide that one-on-one -on -one help throughout the system in in you know the same language? And perhaps the answer really is just to ensure that you know you're working with people that understand you know, user experience and UI much better to ensure that the quality of language in the English language that you're using is is understandable and not overly complicated and that perhaps there's benefits and, you know, steps we can take to make sure that just the basic information is displayed in a more helpful manner first. But it is a very interesting question about how we can sort of better reach and serve the global audience. Yes, I, I agree. Thank you for that. And then I have um, one more question for you, Catherine. Um, someone was asking, is your new submission system uh, a front end on a traditional system like Scholar One, or is it an entirely new system that also does peer review management? Uh, so I, I spoke about a, a submission form. So that's not a system. Mm -hmm. It's just a submission form, sadly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then we are um, getting close to our time to um, wrap up. And um, I would just like to, to again say thank you to our presenters who have agreed to be with us today. And um, I believe that there was some uh, contact information within the presentations, but you can also reach out to SSP staff um, for additional information about our presenters today. And then with that, I will um, hand things back to um, Emily and Jeff at SSP. Great, thank you so much, Ryan. And thank you to Andre and to Catherine and to Lily for this excellent discussion. Thank you to the audience for your questions. Uh, and once again, please do take the time to respond to the webinar evaluation that you'll receive over email. Your feedback helps us to continually improve the webinar program. Reminder that when we send out that webinar, uh, uh, that. Uh, uh, evaluation. We also send out uh, links to the recording, um, so you'll have some of that information available as well. Please join us for the last SSP webinar of the year from the Scholarly Kitchen, The Future of Publisher. That'll be at 12 p.m., different from our usual 11, uh, 11 a.m. Eastern time on Tuesday, November 6th. We'll look forward to seeing you then, and with that, we're concluding. Thank you. <laughs>